Yeah, so I'm Ben. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Um, so I am from the UK originally. I studied computer science there. And so far I've been working in the games industry for about eight years. Uh, I started off as a gameplay programmer, so sort of general purpose kind of everything. And then I sort of gradually specialized into UI and uh, design programming, uh, UI programming. So I spent a bunch of years in Tokyo and Paris and Vancouver now. And uh, these are some of the games I've worked on. I was like a rhythm game on Vita and then uh, adventure game. And I worked on Vampire. And now I'm working on Industries of Titan, which is like a city building game um, for Brace Yourself Games in Vancouver. Um, and that's in Unreal. So, OK, what are we going to talk about today? So today's goal is for you to be able to nail your game's UI on the very first try which is completely unreasonable and just will never happen. So that's that's not actually that. Uh, one more reasonable goal is to be able to nail your game's UI in fewer tries. Like even, yeah, you're never going to get it right in the first time. I certainly don't. For Industries of Titan, it's a constant process of iteration. But like hopefully with some tips and some, uh, yeah, some of the stuff from today, it will be less iterations. OK. so. We're going to have three kind of general topics today. Uh, what are we talking about when we're talking about UI in games? Uh, some rules of thumb that are like will help you when you're designing your UI. Um, and then kind of a process that I follow when I do design um, for the games that I've worked on um, that have helped this, this have helped me, basically. Uh, and there's a couple of design exercises thrown in. So you can kind of, I don't know, scribble stuff on paper, say things in the chat. Um, and I've got little icons in the top where it's like, hey, let's, you know, take part. So we should get a pen and paper ready? I mean, if you have one, I mean, you can always kind of do it in your head or just do your MS Paint is, you know, you can never go wrong with MS Paint or whatever. Um, but yeah, and, yeah know, it's, we, it's simple stuff. I think it's not possible to share things uh, on the chat, uh, share pictures. But if you like, we can use the Slack chat we have if there's something to share. Um, I mean, it it's a lot of them is like you can describe it via text as well. Where I'll be like, oh, how would you design a blah? And you could say, oh, well, I want, I'd have like a, a box and I'd have like some filled in colors. And I don't know. It's mainly like an exercise for yourself. You don't necessarily have to share the stuff you okay. do on paper. It's just like, you know, a little, it's all about, you know, design is a process. So you have to kind of practice it. Okay. So what are we talking about when we talk about user interface design? So, well, the user interface is the stuff you see on screen. Like, I don't want to spend too much time trying to define what we're talking about when you talk about user interface design. Um, it more want to talk about like a useful way of kind of breaking down uh, the user interface and how to design it. Um, so I kind of think about the what you want to show the player in, in three different ways. First, you want to show the game state. Uh, second, you want to show the state change over time. And third, you want to show what the player can do. So we're going to break this down further. It's all like nesting within nesting stuff. So let's start. So what is the goal of user interface in the game, in games in general? So if you're a programmer, you probably start with code. Um, you know, you have an idea of what game you want to make, and you sort of dive in and start programming. You might have like a class uh, of like a hero, and they might have some health and their max health. You might have a, a shop class with some innkeepers and a function to like buy an item. Um, and you might have like some AI uh, that you've spent months making. Um, but none of that really matters. You have to get that information into the player's brain. That, that, this is the player. This is the player's brain. Um, and yeah, the, the goal is to just put information into the player's brain. Um, it's, yeah, basically it. So you definitely want to tell, tell them these things because, you know, what if you spent six months making this amazing AI system? Um, you know, you, you really need to work out how you can put that in their information, in that information in their brain. Because if the player doesn't see it, then to the player, it doesn't really exist. Um, so like if the, if the player never sees the shopkeeper's name shown somewhere, they're never going to know that a shopkeeper technically has a name or the hero has health or a max health. Um, so I don't know, this is like really basic stuff. I guess it's pretty obvious. It's like, oh, well, you know, show the thing. Um, so right now we're talking about showing game state. We'll show the other ones. We'll do the other ones later. 
And I think it really makes sense if you, uh, the students, or I myself, about the last game I programmed, think about what states you have there and maybe something you haven't exposed to the user or not well enough. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that should help to follow this. I've certainly had situations in the past where we've programmed a huge thing and we've sort of tried to expose the state to the player and show like, hey, did you know that, you know, ships arrive when you, uh, when you're, I mean, all right, let's use Industries of Titan for an example, like it's a city building game and enemy ships come and attack you. And we had a, this whole complicated system of like, well, depending on how well the player is doing, uh, we decide to, you know, let ships attack them, but players would, wouldn't understand why they were arrived. Like, they'd be like, oh, I just randomly got attacked. So we sort of gradually had to expose that system to them by showing them, uh, oh, we they attack based on like how much money you've earned. And so we have like a progress bar of like how close you are to being attacked. So it's all about like, you know, showing all these cool systems you designed, you need to show them to the player in some some way. It doesn't have to be just like numbers everywhere, but we'll go into that. Okay, so let's start simple. Okay, so you've got health and max health. How do you communicate that to the player? Uh, any ideas in the chat? Like it's pretty like basic. Yay, health bar. <laughs> More <laughs> creative. Like bar. Bar, bar, bar. Uh, no, that, that, we'll start simple. You can go hearts. Ooh, ooh, we're getting really creative. All right, let's go really simple. Numbers. <laughs> like this, <laughs> this is like, just show the numbers. Yeah, okay. I've got someone said it. Just show the numbers. Like that's, that's like, you know, version one. I was also thinking like Steven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, you're jumping ahead. Oh, these, they're too good. Okay, we'll get there. And, you know, if you want to be really fancy, you could put HP after it to make it really, you know, helpful to players. Um, and then, you know, that goes straight into the player's brain. And yay, we've communicated a state. We've got the health and the max health. Okay. So what other methods have we got for communicating state? Let me just move this over here. Uh, okay. So you can have a think about what other ways we can communicate stuff. And I'm going to show you this, which is <laughs> an overload of communicating state. This is uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, I think this is probably half fake, but half based on real, uh, real life. This is like, you know, this is when you can go overboard with communicating state. I just kind of want to show this is like uh, more numbers is not necessarily great, or more state is not necessarily great. Like there's a, there's a balance. I guess you need um, to be trained for this one to know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely like a, uh, yeah, an extreme example. Okay, so we've got. What other things can people, as people say, people, someone said opacity. Yeah, you could use opacity to show um, like the, you know, how much, uh, you know, what the state of something is, like a percentage. Um, any other ideas? Yeah. It's pretty, Are we still it's talking about the process. health or any uh, more general? I mean, anything really. Like, how would you, if you want to communicate something, how would you do it? Yeah, sound, color. These are good. Uh, yeah, Spencer's vibration. That's pretty, that's pretty creative. Yeah. Flashing icons, yeah. These are all these are really solid. So I've got a bunch of examples here. Pain. Uh, <laughs> yeah, someone said pain. I don't, I don't, I don't want to know too much about that. Okay, so this one is, you know, Mario, Luigi. You've got some icons there. You've got some text, some numbers. Uh, like, oh, this one's a an empty version of the same thing to show that something's missing. Um, you've got like numbers. Uh, different colors here to be like, oh, okay, you're this is a maybe this is going down. Maybe red is negative and blue is positive. Size, yeah, size is a good one from Sean. Uh, here's some more numbers, pictures. Uh, we've got some progress bars here. So you, that's size, I guess. Like the the size of the bar represents like you know the percentage. Um, what stuff we've got flashing, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's a really open question, basically anything like humans are really good at, at just, you know, absorbing information, coming up with patterns and stuff. So if you can understand it and you test it on a bunch of players and they seem to understand it, you've communicated something, right? I mean, it depends on what you're trying to communicate. Um, you know, if you want to communicate an exact number, like, you know, how many points they've got, you probably want to do that with a, an actual set of digits rather than, I don't know, a pie chart or something. Um, but yeah, there's a whole I, bunch I of I really liked your first example about the placeholder. Um, 
this place the, over? Um, the one on the left where you show that you can probably earn three coins and maybe not more. Yeah, so that's kind of showing them that there's, you know, the fact that there's three and these coins are separate to regular coins would maybe imply to a player that, I don't know, a lot of these things, you don't think about it too much, but your your brain kind of gets it intuitively. You're like, okay, there's something special about these three. There's three, and there's and I've got two of three. Like, it, it's a really elegant way to, to explain something quite simple. I mean, it, it seems like kind of over-explaining these things, but like, you know, as a, as a, designer as a programmer you can start off and just be like oh you, you write the number of coins big coins you just write one and you're like okay we're one of three and then you might move that to an icon it's sort of a, a very iterative thing like trying to show the player what's important uh facial expression of a character that's that's cool that yeah <laughs> that happens in old doom right as the as the guy takes more damage he gets more and more like his face gets more and more bloody Sorry. okay <laughs> okay still on the blood <laughs> Okay. Oops, these are out of order. So yeah, other methods to communicate state. We've talked about these text, number, color icons. I mean, borders is just kind of colors and lines, background colors. So in this example at the bottom here, this is from uh, Zelda. So like, oh, this is your equipped item has a blue background and the one that your cursor is over has like a separate border. We've got icons here for showing some information about the, the weapon. And then, like, I guess that's I think that's how much damage it does um, in the numbers there. So I don't know when you're when you're thinking about okay, I've got this system and I want to or this state and I want to communicate it to the player. The simplest thing to start with is just numbers because it's well, it's usually the simplest thing is just to throw some numbers up on screen. But then you can kind of explore out from there and think, oh, well, what's the what is the easiest way to understand this information? Am I do I care about the percentage of something? So maybe I'll show it as like a bar or a, a pie chart. Or is it something that is more binary, like like this, for example? Is like, oh well, is it is it rare or not? Um, or is it? I can't remember what these icons are. It's been too long since I played this. Um, but for example, this uh, that you got this icon around the, the outside here to show that this one's like a, a boss character or an important character from Hearthstone. So yeah. Do you recommend uh, to start off with the numbers and then go into more detail, or should you grab a pen and paper and flesh it completely out? Um, I usually kind of bounce between, I, I do a bunch of like iterations on paper usually of, of, of what I need to show in a particular widget. This is something I talk about a bit later in the, in the, um, when I talk about my process, but yeah, it's, it's something I usually do on paper where I'll think like, okay, or well, how is it with numbers? Is that okay? Okay. What about icons? What about like percentage bars? What about like, what do I need to show related to for example, this is like a, a weapon. What, what do I need to show related to a weapon in an inventory? Well, I want to show the, the damage. That's important. I want to show like the, some status thing. Uh, I want to show a picture. Maybe I want to show selected state. So I kind of go through all, all the things I need to show. And then I kind of think like how is best to show those. And it, it's always an iterative process. You'll, you'll try something on paper, put it in game, try it for a bit. Maybe you realize yourself it's not great, or players will give you feedback, or other people will give you feedback, and then you maybe go back to paper, come up with some other ideas. Update. It's very much like an iterative. Thing. I think you're gonna still come to your rules of thumb and these suggestions, but is there some rule that you should combine different things? Like here we see, for instance, one number per item, and then yeah. some highlight around is good to combine things. So that's actually something what what I recommend when writing a research paper. You should have one table. You should have one nice figure. You should have one graph. Uh, it makes a, a paper look complete. Is it similar yeah. here that you some things you should represent as numbers? Not everything should be just buttons and bars. Or, I mean, it, it definitely it helps players to have things broken up in states. Like imagine you had. I mean, it's hard to think of an example here, but if, imagine you wanted to show this icon as like you decided to show it as text or. Mm -hmm. you, you wanted to show more numbers of like what's the durability of the um the item you could show a whole bunch of numbers here but yeah the more numbers you show the more overwhelming it becomes um and they've they've done stuff here with uh, with splatoon where they've tried to separate the numbers out with icons and and keep the level mm -hmm. over here and it's a different typeface and yeah it's it's hard to think about it with examples but yeah you definitely want to balance like overloading the player with all of the information versus like showing some information in pie charts versus some information in like raw numbers. Like 
It kind of depends on what you're trying to show. There's a question, we, wait, Jovan. Um, how much should the UI be intuitive compared to interesting? Uh, yeah. Uh, it depends on what you mean by interesting. I guess you mean like visually attractive. There's there's definitely a balance between like you know making it really flashy and showy um, versus you know how simple and easy to read it is. I mean, I get, it's a whole bunch of factors. It's like what's your audience are they you know hardcore players is it more of a casual thing what's the how often are they seeing the, the the menu um is it something where it's like oh you take you have to drill down through three or four menus to get to like your stats page in that case you probably want it pretty dry and easy to read because there's a lot of information versus like it's something you see every time you win a game you would have like a nice big uh flashy something that's maybe not super uh intuitive but is really visually stimulating um like you know uh, i'm just trying to think of examples here like uh the level here is really big so you can have it in this fancy font but this the word level itself is small and so you want quite a simple typeface there um and the same for this in zelda like they've gone for like this is i don't even know what typeface this is but it's, it's really simple because the rest of the flavor comes from the rest of the ui um yeah, Persona UI I show later on. Persona UI is like the extreme end of interesting. Um, but I think some of the more, the ones where you go into more detail about the character, they, they kind of tone down the, the kind of over the top uh, visuals and make it a little bit more uh, intuitive. If, that's a, if that makes sense. Okay. So we talked about uh, the game state. Let's talk a quick bit about state change. So, uh, imagine you've got this health system again, and you want to show a health change. So this would be like some recent change over time. Like imagine you've taken damage or you've uh, been healed. Um, we've got our trusty health bar again. It'd just be a simple case of, you know, you show the change. Um, it's And the player knows that like, they've lost health. Like it's not super duper rocket science, but I think separating the current state versus like what changed is really useful for players. If you don't have this, sometimes if you've played a game, you might uh, suddenly die and you don't know why. And um, because the game maybe wasn't showing you the fact that you've been losing health um, and you, you, you don't, it's harder for players to notice like, oh, seven changed to six, changed to five, changed to four, because it's just one number taking up the same amount of visual space. So you, you need to flag uh, what has changed to the player. Um, yeah, if it's important. I mean, obviously you don't want to overload them with too many things, but like this is something I'm trying to, yeah, show the player the things that are important. Um, so answers in the chat. How would we communicate state change? Like how would you, how could you show players something has changed? I mean, there's a pretty vague thing again, but okay, Spencer says color. Yeah, makes me bold, sound. Yep. Uh, what have we got? Colors, animation. Yeah, I mean, animation is, yeah, it's basically just something changing over time. Uh, what else we got? Oh, yeah, Angela says music. Lighten things up. Yeah, I like the pop up there. I pop out there. Um, do you also play with kind of the 3D perception of an interface, or is for you an interface always a 2D thing? Most uh, of the time it is, but. Yeah, I haven't dealt much with VR. I mean, that's definitely you can have you can do some three D things there. But I mean, showing something on top of the of a, another thing and then you know blurring out the background and that, that's one way of making it have that sort of depth feeling. Uh, vibrations, yeah, these are these are good ideas. I didn't actually write down vibrations, but yeah, you can you know rumble a controller um, when you know you take a bunch of damage. That would communicate that something has changed. It wouldn't necessarily tell you exactly what, but it would communicate that you know something's happened. Um, Okay, I mean, it's basically changed something. Like it, it, you need time in order to have a state change. So it's it's pretty, uh, it's pretty simple like that. You want to show and hide elements. It's probably the simplest way. So often I start with that before adding like too much, you know. Before the, the easiest thing usually in code is just to show and hide something. Um, you just show a window, something happened, and hide it again. Um, one of the other useful things you can use are um, tweening or easing libraries. So this is more of a coding thing but it, it's useful for doing kind of really quick animations so you can you know it just adds a bit of polish you can like make something show in a smooth way um, 
So one of the things you want to balance when you do when you're communicating state change is whether is is if something if the change is important or not. So on the left we've got slow motion uh, Luigi like getting coins. So there's not a lot changing here in the screen. Then the score is going up and they're getting coins, um, but they're not completely overwhelming visuals. Um, the, the you know, see the coin number is jumping slightly. And then the score is going up without jumping um, because, I mean, getting coins is more important than the score going up. So it's relatively small on screen. I mean, this is kind of zoomed in a bit. Um, and then in comparison, this is in Overwatch when you go from 99% uh, on your ultimate to 100%. Oh, great. It's not going to load. <laughs> Come on. Too high quality. Uh-oh. Oh, it's 360p. That's pretty high quality. OK. <laughs> uh, well, it does. What's going on? Um, I can post the slides again. Yeah. Um, Basically, I... oh, here we go. It goes super duper juicy, huge animation going from, because it's basically the most important thing in the in the game almost. It's, it's a huge you know, ability that you can use. Um, so yeah, it's a state change from you know, 99 to 100. The, the simplest, most boring way you could show it is just 99, 100, and put the fact that you can activate the ability. But obviously, because it's so important, you really want to flag it to the player that like, hey, this, is be this has become available. Like Now you can you know, do your alt. Um, so yeah, like the, the importance, yeah, I'm just trying to communicate here that the less important changes, you do smaller animations more easily ignored in, in animations and then really important stuff, you make it really big. Um, so it's the same for like, you know, if the player's about to die, you might show their health flashing really loud, but if they lose a little bit of health when they've got 80% health, you wouldn't show that as much. Okay. Um, so next I want to show, talk about showing the player what's possible. Like what are the possible actions? So if you look at this screen, if you've played games before, um, you probably intuitively think like, I want to click these buttons. I want to, you know, this is a button. This is a button. They look kind of clicky um, because they've got this drop shadow and they kind of have this fake kind of 3D perspective that they're, you know, rising up out of the screen. Um, and the same here, this looks like maybe it's like a clickable something uh, and the same down here. Uh, and this sort of, outline here maybe makes you think that like, okay, this is selected. And the fact that it's a grid make, make you think like, oh, if I press right, I'll go right. Um, so the technical term for this is affordance. Uh, it's like, uh, you can say like a bottle cap affords twisting. It's like the things you can do with a th something. Um, so a, a door affords pushing and pulling. So in these previous examples, you know, this is a, a thing on screen that affords clicking or it affords, you know, moving the cursor around. Um, so if you want to, yeah, search for other research on that, that's what it's called. So it's important to differentiate between what the actual affordances are of something versus the perceived affordances. So if you have these two examples here, the actual affordances are the same, you can click on it, um, but the perceived affordances are different. So this on the left kind of looks like something we could touch with our finger. It has like a clear border and outline. Um, this is more specifically for something that's like mouse based or cursor or, or touch based. Um, but yeah, like that's an important thing to think about. I think what do you want your players to know that they can do? Um, and this works even going back to here, this works even with uh, a, something that is not touch screen. I think this is from like a Wii U uh, game. So this is technically touch, um, but showing the fact that there's like a shortcut icon here shows you that you can press minus uh, and it will activate the delete button or the delete function. And the same for like plus or the one button down here. Okay. Um, and this is another example. Somehow this has become synonymous with dragging. I'm sure there's some history there uh, that it's like, I guess it looks like it's kind of grippy to your finger. So if you you know you put your finger on it or grab it, it will like stick to your hand because it's got more friction. So you want to, and your hand, I guess in a in a mouse based system, your cursor would change to a hand when you're over it to show you that 
there it has the affordance of dragging. Um, yeah, yeah it, so it's kind funny of a, how much it, yeah, how, uh, you're trying to model real buttons, and it requires you to know what a real button is. Then it's intuitive for you. But if, yeah, if you have a different background, you, you might think very differently about a, a UI. Do you do some yeah. kind of localization for UI as well? Are there different trends, different conventions for different parts of the world, or it kind of for colors to... certainly that's something mm -hmm. i mentioned later on there's certainly colors and um symbols and things that are not universal but um what is a button like i mean we all have fingers and hands and stuff i mean not you know most people you you know fingers and hands and things um so i guess that's more universal yeah <laughs> um, but if you've yeah. never dealt with buttons but you have only used touch things i guess you're still using your finger or your the mouse is an extension of your hand i guess it's still kind of tactile yeah. um it kind of makes me think of the you know we have the the floppy disk as the save icon but there's a huge you know generation of people that have never seen like a real floppy disk or touch one but somehow that's the save icon like i, I know i've heard of people where you know they're like oh what what is that like they know that it's like a save thing but then you know it took them a while <laughs> to realize like oh it has this history behind it um yeah and the fact it took me the longest time to realize that like in ui you have something called radio buttons where you know you press one and the other one gets deselected um and it comes from physical radios where you would have like different stations for each tune to like each button and of course if you want to press the one button for preset one it deselects the other buttons on the radio and i never put those two together because i was just after the generation that had those physical anyway that's a... <laughs> I recall as a kid that it was quite fascinating to press one button and the other one would lift. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but yeah, I never connected the dots either. But yeah, yeah. Oh well, yeah, other people seem to have, yeah have the same experience. So I'm glad I'm not the only person. Um, so yeah, so these these three different things I mentioned about game state and state changes and possible actions, you can factor all of those in um, when you're kind of designing your UI visuals, and then that will hopefully communicate what is going on in your game to the player's brain. OK, and then they'll understand your game. Yay. OK. Uh, so we've kind of done this, I guess, when we were talking about like design a way of showing player health. Um, you can do this on your own. You think about if you've got a game that you're making or that you, you know, you'd like to make. There's many different ways of showing health. You could kind of design it yourself, basically. Uh, and much the the uh suggestions in the chat last time were, were pretty good on this already so uh maybe we can also go the other way around um do you in your game do you have an aspect where you have no idea how to represent it well <laughs> or one where you're yeah. particularly proud of uh we do uh explaining it would take a while i think there's this one aspect yeah, i actually met the students like... but yeah go ahead with yours as well so the students <laughs> okay, can yeah, think if you, to... you give yours <laughs> okay yeah no, no that'd be good yeah if 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 yes yeah, go for the students like um yeah if there's something that's quite hard to 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 show that has but, like a but you had a good one so, so go ahead with your spend yeah. oh no mine would yeah mine would take a long time to explain but it's something okay. that we've uh designed and redesigned it like six or seven times and we're still not quite happy with it because it's like it's three or four into like interlocking mechanics and you end up we've tried tables we've tried like different anyway it's tricky <laughs> spencer has a question um about the do you take the technical difficulty in, into account? I guess that means how difficult it will be to implement. Of course, the students are thinking about how many points they were going to get for this feature and how long it will take for them to implement it. Um, yeah. For you, it's the same, right? You have a limited amount of time, and you. you... Yeah, I often I often find that's kind of a, a downside to knowing the technical difficulty. Like sometimes I'll I'll because I'm the programmer, I'm the one implementing it, and I'm also kind of doing some of the design, I'll often fall into the trap of just kind of doing what's easy. It's like, oh, I've got a widget for that. Um, I know how to do a progress bar. I can show it this way and that way. Um, and yeah, I'll do what's quick and seems to you know tick the boxes uh, quick enough. But you can often miss some of the more creative and maybe more intuitive approaches for the player that might take a bit longer to uh design and so sometimes i can talk to with the ui artist antoine on the team and he'll come up with something that i never would have thought of that's like not one of my existing widgets but uh might take slightly long to implement lo longer to implement but is way clearer like uh, some you know custom material or some custom way of uh showing like 
I don't know, the number of resources the, the player has. Um, so like, yeah, I think our programmers take technical difficulty into account, but designers don't, and that's good. <laughs> like, I think you, you, the aim is to do the best thing for the player, not the easiest thing for the for the programmer. And then it might be a discussion of like, well, okay, it's going to take me like a week to implement that idea. Can we do this, which is you know three quarters of the way there, and only takes a day, and then we'll see if it's good, and then maybe, um, yeah, we'll get closer. Uh, does iterating over the design take longer than implementing? Ask Rebecca. Uh, iterating is like kind of the whole process of like paper to uh, putting it in game to testing it and then going back. Um, but implementing it is usually the slowest part of that. Like uh, I've got a slide later on where I say, you know, on paper coming up with different designs is like one minute. You know, you can sketch out like a, a pie chart or a bar or a bunch of numbers or something fancy. And then doing it in, I don't know, uh, Photoshop or something, a mock-up in Photoshop might take you an hour, um, but then doing it in code might take you a day. It's like kind of like multiples of, of, of time as you, as you go longer. So like you usually want to do more iteration on the earlier stuff and like, you know, come up with a whole bunch of stuff on paper, come up with, you know, I don't know, come up with 50 on paper, come up with 10 in Photoshop and come up with two or one, I guess, in, in, the, in the code. And then eventually if that doesn't work, you go back to the, the paper. Uh, how hard is it to bring uniqueness and theme into UI, says Joanne? Uh, yeah, that's something that is a balance. Like often you, you want to make, you know, you, you say you've got a game about um, uh, medieval stuff or, or Vikings. You, you might want to try and like make super unique stuff into the UI. You want all of your text to look like Viking uh, runes and you want all of your UI to look really like themed. Um, you can do that, but it's kind of, you can make it too hard to read. And uh, I think a lot of the theme can come from quite a small number of elements. Um, it's a bit abstract, but like you could, you, you can give the feeling of Vikingness just with like everything's in fairly normal text, like, you know, uh, serif text like this. And then you might have like one little widget that has like a rune on it. And it's surprising how small things like that can can make the player feel that the UI is Viking-y. Like, yeah. Okay. Does it help? Uh, Rebecca says, in the code implementation, not prototyping. Just thinking that if you're going to put a lot more time into design, the cost of code implementation isn't that much. Yeah, the, the code implementation will be smaller, I guess, if you carry on with lots of time doing the design. Yeah, I think the yeah. biggest factor is that you should, if you iterate before, then you don't have to re-implement things over and over again. Yeah. Like you yeah, said, it's the, much cheaper to iterate there. Yeah. You want to avoid doing stuff over and over in, in code because that's the slowest part. But I guess it's, it's kind two of processes. Inevitable. So the, the design of the UI artistically is one thing which takes a lot of time. Mm. Implementation is another. You, then you still have to design your design. <laughs> like how do you <laughs> actually yeah. realize your vision? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go on. Uh, okay. So the, this is kind of what we were talked about before. You can show player health in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, progress bars, hearts. These are a lot of things um, that were mentioned before in the chat. You now you could do pie charts and, and progress bars with numbers and uh, hearts and things. Um, so the one final thing I want to talk about in this section when we're talking about uh, kind of design is what if we could do more than help players understand the game? So like up till now we've been doing very much like functional stuff um you know i want them to understand how much health the player has um i want to, them to understand that they've taken damage like that's fairly dry um but what if we could make players feel through the ui like it's a kind of you know floaty idea but like i'm gonna i'm gonna blow your minds it's gonna be amazing okay so what if you wanted to make you make a game that feels relaxed and simple and easy going like you probably think about the art in the 3D space, the, the music, the feel of the game, the game mechanics. Um, but you can kind of follow that through into the UI. You wouldn't want to counteract that with the UI. So for example, you know, Zelda, classic Zelda, um, if you have a segmented health system, it's way more simpler, it's way more simple than something with like tons of numbers. Um, you can use it 
to have a simple experience that's easy to understand at a glance. Um, you know, as a you know, as a really young kid, you can understand like, oh, heart equals good. Uh, I have this many hearts. These this one has some part removed. It's just like really simple. And it can work with object pickups. So like, oh, I pick up a heart container and I increase my health by one. I pick up a heart itself and I get, you know, one heart back, one health back. So in the same way, what if you want to just show uh, the player growing stronger over time? You could do that with just like tons of numbers. Uh, so this is like Final Fantasy VII, uh, just RPGs in general. Like you start with 300 health and by the end of the game, you've got like 9999 health. You, you're going to feel more powerful. Like numbers just go up. Um, so the way that way the UI can kind of uh, reinforce that feeling of like growing more powerful. Um, this is something someone mentioned earlier. So like you want to have a really simple health system. Um, this is just focusing on health systems, right? Like hearts or numbers. So if you want to just have a really simple health system that just tells the player like run away or fight, um, you could do the blood borders thing where, you know, if you have the blood borders, you know, run away. If you don't, then fight. Um, so it's deliberately vague. There probably is a number under the hood of like 0%, uh, you've got 100% health or you're about to die with 0% health. But to the player, you don't really care about that percentage. Um, like what the 0% health point is really not clear, like how, how much blood is like dead. Um, it's just a case of like warning the player, hey, like get in cover. Um, and it works with regenerating health quite nicely as the blood mist goes away. So yeah, compared to like classic FPS where it used to be like an actual number with a face um, that worked well with like health pickups and stuff. Um, but this is, that's kind of more of a different feeling than the, the blood mist thing. Um, and then finally, what if you wanted to show, like make the player feel fearful and uncertain? Um, well, you could do the same thing and, and kind of hide information from the player. So these are from uh, Resident Evil and uh, Silent Hill. You know, you, you keep it deliberately uh, vague. Like you don't want them to know, oh, I have exactly 64% health and this healing item gives me 25 health. So I, it's worth using it. Like you kind of want them to like panic. Like, should I, I, I don't have that many healing items. Like I want to, uh, should I waste it? Like, and, and, you know, heal myself too much. Um, so yeah, the, the, what I'm trying to convey here is like when you're thinking about uh, your UI design, um you there is like you know step one is to like communicating the information to the player like then once that uh kind of works you can maybe think more about like what i want to kind of reinforce the feeling i'm going with my game um like you know if you mismatched something like this you put you put this kind of like partial health info thing in like i don't know zelda it would change the feel of the game or like blood mist or something like it, it's like comical um so yeah, you want your, your UI to kind of reinforce the, the feeling you want the players to have. Uh, okay. So what we talked about for design is, uh, first of all, you want to give them a window into like the, the state of the game uh, and then tell them about important state changes. Um, you also can show them what they can do uh, through affordances. So like, is this button clickable? Uh, how do I activate this ability? Um, and then you can also control what the players feel. Um, yeah, so like that's the the main start of the the presentation. Um, some people talking about oh yeah, <laughs> Dead Space where you show the health on the character's back. Yeah, that's a that's actually a percentage. Even though that game, that game is like a horror game, it does show it as you as a progress bar on the back. I guess that does kind of counteract the whole like, you know, imperfect information thing. Um, yeah, I guess that works. Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about some rules of thumb. These are kind of like general uh, guidelines that, that I've kind of found online or developed or, you know, through my, through doing UI design and through like making games. Uh, there is no like one weird trick to totally solve like UI. Uh, you know, make the UI in your game amazing. 
Um, there's a bunch of like rules and rules of thumb and like guidelines and you know things to try. They're basically like tools you can use um, to design and, and analyze other games. Uh, they're not always useful everywhere and sometimes uh, yeah, they're not useful at all. And so today I'm just going to show you a couple to kind of get you thinking about uh, when you design your game, you can maybe try this rule out and think, okay, well, based on this rule, I should move these things here, or I should use this color, or I should like arrange, yeah, my information this way. Okay, yeah, you learn when to use them, when to ignore them. This is very much like a process thing, like design is, is doing stuff and trying it and seeing if it works and trying it on players. Um, okay, so the question here is, what do you see? What's the first thing you see when you see this screenshot? Like, like first split second. The character. Yay, everyone says the character. It's Zenyatta. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the first thing is you see it's you see his answer in the chat. Yeah, that's very true. That was the first thing that appeared on screen. Yeah, so Zenyatta's huge. Like, I mean, he takes up what like three quarters of the screen? Like absolutely massive. Um, and then what's the second thing you see? Yeah, we've got the logo, the menu. Yeah, what about the third thing you see? Or third things you see? What other stuff do you see? Player tag, uh, exit game. Yeah, so this is kind of what I'm trying to show is that, okay, first thing you see is the character. I didn't put a big box around him because I forgot. Second thing you might see is like the Overwatch logo and these big this big text on the left, um, and maybe Zenyatta's name on the right. Maybe not because he's kind of hidden over there on the right. Um, yeah, and the third thing you might see is this kind of group of of options here and the characters, uh, the player profile name in the top right. Maybe the number of unlocks and then this kind of one of the last things you might see is it's kind of hidden under here. But yeah, the the uh, press enter to chat button. So this is the first rule of thumb, is uh, using visual priority to guide the player. So as I tried to show you here, like you don't see everything at once. Like You don't immediately take in everything with the same visual priority. Your eyes are guided by a lot of different factors. Um, and you can use those factors to kind of tell the player what's important. So if in Overwatch, the character is the most important. Like Overwatch is like a superhero's kind of uh, first person shooter team game and the focus is on these unique kind of comic book heroes. Um, so that's the most important thing. And then the second most important thing is the name of the game and what you can do. Um, and then the less important things are like what, you know, secondary options, um, like who your character is and who your, or your player profile is. Uh, is there a rule in terms of direction to guide people's line of sight? So that's a good question. Let's go here. So, okay, <laughs> what do you think might affect visual priority in the chat? Ellen says contrast, that's good. Size, a bunch of people said size, it did appear on the screen, yeah. One who says placement, yep. Spotlight, visual effects, alignment, these are all great. Alpha, yeah, if something's more transparent, it's definitely gonna be less visible, that's like related to contrast. Animation, flashing, yeah, stuff over time will really help. Justin uh, mentioned left to right. This is one of his things which you might want to change for different cultures. Yes, yes. that's exactly right. Uh, shininess, yeah. Shininess is contrast, basically. Like, so if something's very shiny, you have these white highlights and these kind of dark shadows. So that's contrast. Okay, so I think we've got most of them. So size, contrast. Yeah, so the... the the color is not the only thing if your entire UI is yellow, adding more yellow doesn't help. Um, shape, I mean, as humans, we'd kind of generally notice jagged shapes because they look more aggressive and scary and round shapes look less scary. Uh, position, so yeah, if you come from a left to right reading, you know, like language background culture, um, you will probably look in the top left hand corner uh, I mean, that is kind of balanced with proximity to center because like generally with a, a screen, you're going to be looking at the middle. So Zenyatta is in the middle, but then you, after that, the first place you might go is probably top left because that's where you go in a book. 
Um, but yeah, as you say, if you if you're coming from a a right to left language, your eye might go to top right. Or if you've kept playing games that are always left to right, you might be like, well, okay, when I read a book, I go top right, but when I play a game, I have to go top left because they're not localized for me as much. Um, so yeah, so one thing, a little trick that I find useful to check visual priority is like take your glasses off, squint your eyes, make the thing really small and just see what you still notice. So in this case, like I still see Zenyatta. I can't really see this uh, click thing and the social is really hard to see. Um, and yeah, just kind of make, seeing what, what is revealed or what do you notice um, as something gets bigger. So like I, I do that with my, some of my UIs. I kind of you know sit further away from it or make it small and think, okay, is the thing I care about or is the thing I want the players to care about still noticeable? Like, where does my eye go? Do I actually still see the most important buttons? Um, or is everything kind of like just the same priority? Because I mean, making everything the same size, whether it's massive or small, is, is still not going to solve uh, the problem. Uh, Joan says, then in some cultures where the literature is right to left, do we change the UI for them? So that's a good question. Uh, I've I think yes, in theory, but the amount of implementation time it takes is a lot. Um, so I was actually asking some players uh, that a couple of months ago, no, it was probably last year. Um, and some games do do that. So FIFA, I think does it because um, they, they have a huge number of players in right to left languages like Arabic. Uh, and so they do, they flip the entire UI. Um, and so play and stuff would be on the right hand side, reading right to left. But the only downside is players who have played older games that haven't been localized wouldn't necessarily be used to it. And if when they see people playing online, if they're seeing them play in English, um, everything will be on the left. So it'll kind of like they'll have to get used to that. Um, but like um, iOS and Android do that from what I understand. Like everything is flipped. When you press back, the menu will slide the opposite way to a right to left and the back button won't be top left. It will be top right. So yeah, everything gets flipped. But yeah, if you if you do that for your game, then kudos to you because like that's yeah that takes time. <laughs> um, oh, how do you handle massive differences in string length due to language localization? So that's kind of a related thing. Uh, there's a lot of different options there. Uh, it's something we're doing in Industry of Titan right now. Um, you you make the text wrap. You make sure the button is big enough, or make the button change size depending on the the length of the text. You change the text size. You ask the localization people very, very nicely if they can use a slightly shorter word. Um, there's a lot of options there. Uh, I mean, ideally you design your buttons with, you know, 30% extra space to to what the you have in English. That's kind of a general rule of thumb because French and German might be 30 to 50% larger. Um, I know in some cases, if, if you design in Japanese, it'll be like two characters and then, you know, classic in old games, you'd end up with the word start like really crammed in there because in Japanese it's really small. And then like in French, come on, say would be like totally squished in there. Okay. So that was visual priority. So we're going to move on to another rule of thumb. So if you saw this immediately, what would you think? This is a button on the left. Will weather effects be shown in game if you saw this in like an options menu? We've got yes, no, question, no, question mark, yes, no. No, because there's an X. So it's mixed, mostly no. Uh, Mandy says, this is confusing now. Yay. OK, that's exactly the, the feeling I wanted. OK, uh, I'm a little confused now. Yeah, that's true. OK, so how about now? Is weather effects going to be shown or not? Uh, okay, we've got some yes. Okay, now everyone says yes. Okay, so this is to try and highlight to you that you need to use existing player knowledge. Um, so what I mean by that is players are not a blank slate. They're gonna come to your game with a whole bunch of existing knowledge. Um, and that might come from their culture, the language they speak or languages they speak, uh, other games they've played, uh, other software they've used, like anything, you know, you, you, your player has a whole bunch of things with them. Um, and the problem is if your game is different to that knowledge, it's gonna make your game harder to play or harder to learn. 
Um, and that was an example there, right? Like uh, in English, we use X to mean like no or, or not or don't or bad or whatever. We use it for a whole bunch of, but it's always negative. Um, and so here the immediate thought is X equals off. Uh, so they're disabled, so you won't show the weather effects. But then you see it here, and you think, "Oh, white is stands out more than gray." So actually, X in this situation means yes, we will show weather effects. So, okay, I, I keep doing this. I keep showing the answer. Okay, what kind of existing knowledge might? Uh, well, actually, no, I kind of showed that in the previous one. They will come with existing knowledge of culture and languages. So, simple meanings. So this is kind of a more famous one. So in uh, Europe, generally like Czech will be used to say yes, uh, okay, positive, you know, something like that. And then cross will be used for no, negative, like false. Uh, in Japan, circle is used for yes. And then either Czech or X can be used to say no. So when I was learning Japanese and getting my homework, I got a whole bunch of checks and thought I was doing really well. And then my teacher said, actually, no, that these are all wrong. And so that, was, <laughs> that was definitely a learning moment. Wrong feedback. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so that's why in, on PlayStation, in if you play PlayStation in Japan, the circle button is used for confirm and X is used for uh, cancel. Although I heard they're changing that with PS5. But anyway, that's the historical reasons. Uh, we also have color associations depending on culture. These are not global, but like seeing something like this can be really confusing. You're like, okay, well, red is used on, uh, yeah, traffic lights to mean stop. So good, Brent says he hates it. That's the kind of uh, feedback I want. So, I mean, that's not completely crazy. You know, if you, you could see something like this in a game um, if you didn't think about it too much. Um, what other stuff do we have? uh word meanings like um if you just have the word bank like am i talking about like a bank that you put uh money in or a bank of a river or bank as in like to turn a plane um there's a whole bunch of different word meanings that you might need to be careful of um players might come with some preconceived you know notion of what what are we talking about um uh, like when you say store it, am we talking about like to to store something in a box or are we talking about a shop um, input conventions is kind of like what I said here, like it could be uh, circle could be confirm and then X could be cancel. Um, that also applies to like keyboard layouts and stuff. Um, like in French you have, it's not QWERTY, it's AZERTY. Um, so yeah, just try and think about what your players are coming to and try and give them the least surprising thing. Like sometimes you might be trying to show them something brand new and you're like have to kind of ease them into like this new thing where, oh, in my game, green is poison. So green is bad and red is like health. So red is good. And maybe with enough surrounding context, they would understand that like in this case, we're not talking about like go and stop. We're talking about like, you know, fantasy poison and health and stuff. So. You know, if you show them a heart or the blood symbol with the red, they might understand that oh, in this case, it's kind of good. So yeah, and that'd be using their existing knowledge of role-playing games. Okay. So what is wrong with this mock-up? This one's a little bit harder, I guess. I'll ask Jason's question, answer Jason's question in a second. Actually, I'll do it now while you guys have to think about that. Jason says, do you guys uh, do a lot of user testing to find out what works for certain audiences? Yeah, like doing testing on different kinds of audiences is really important. Um, I mean, ideally you do it like completely cross culture. You do it across many different levels of experience. Like what does an expert user, someone who's played that, that genre of game, you know, for hundreds of hours, how do they feel about the game versus someone who has never played that game, um, people that are used to PC games versus you know console games. So yeah, a lot of testing across different groups. Okay, well, this example wasn't that great. A lot of, there's a whole bunch of different things, but it's like, what's wrong with it? Uh, okay, I need to revise this one. Numbers don't add up to the total, that's true. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to show is that these are like super far apart. 
so you wouldn't know like can i afford this like your eyes are kind of darting really far um this one's more of a niche thing i think uh like to solve that you would want to put the information that's re uh, related to uh the information that's related like near to something else like I've, I've played a bunch of games where you know you're looking your eyes are like going between two different areas or you have to remember a number from one screen and then remember it to the to the next um, would you simply duplicate it in this case would you keep it on the left because maybe in game you always want to have a monitor of your money yeah i think in this case i mean yeah i think it, it, the, the lesser of you know two evils is in this case is having the duplication is better than having to look in two places and be like, oh, well, I don't have duplication. I think players are not going to care about duplication too much if they, their eyes are like so focused on the center, they're not going to care that it's duplicated. Um, so yeah, we should probably show amount remaining as well. Yeah, how much money will you have afterwards? That's totally true. Because um, yeah, the player is going to be like, well, I, I guess this number on the left is bigger than the one on the right, but by how much? Like, yeah. And change the color of text to show it's affordable. Yay! Yeah, red money. Yeah, okay. So yeah, you, this is a much better version than what I've got here. Yeah, you guys are doing amazing. Okay, so the rule of thumb is minimize distance between related information. At least that's how I put it. Um, so the idea is, do you put everything the player needs to know in the same place? So that would include, like what you just said, if the you know the information they might need to know might be after you purchase this, how much money will you have left? So yeah, you would show you have this you your total that you will be buying is this and this is how much you'll have afterwards so that's kind of like related information um, and then when we talk about distance here it can be both space and time so what we showed there is space you know on screen but sometimes you might uh, have something where you would be told you got 100 xp and then you'll have to like quit out of that menu and go to another menu and then jump in and see how much your total xp is that's like a distance in time. You have to keep things in your head. Um, so yeah, put related information nearby. So this would be like an example. Oh, I got 100 XP, but what's my total XP now? How close am I to leveling up? Like you want to kind of show everything that's related like really nearby. Um, and so an example of that is here. That it really clearly shows that like you got 1,550 points look, oh, you just gained this. It's duplicated, but that's fine. Here's your progress towards your next like level up. Here's the totals. It's, it's like super clear. Um, I mean, it's duplicated three times here, but it, it doesn't matter. Like it's, the player can't miss it. Um, and this is also the, it, it fulfills that size thing we were talking about where like center of the screen and largest is how many points you got. And then secondary, these other numbers. And then like these, this text might be third. And then down here, you know, it's much less important. You're mostly talking about recognizing what's on the screen. Another mm -hmm. thing is also if you want to click buttons, do, do you come to that? Um, if you want to, so for for distance, mm -hmm. um, yeah. If you have something where you're often clicking between, you know, usually do this action and then often you do this action afterwards. Um, you would probably want to put those pretty close to each other. Otherwise, you're always like throwing your mouse up to one corner and then throwing it down to the bottom corner. And then, yeah, you'd want to put like related actions nearby as well. It just helps like uh, the player understand that these two are, are, simple, are related. They're also physically like easier to mouse between. So, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if you use that as well, but there's this fits law, which is used a lot in other HCI applications. Mm -hmm. I will just put a link in chat. It goes beyond what we were talking here, but essentially, as a function of size and distance, for instance, you could come up with a function of how difficult it will be for the user to click a button. And you could literally run an optimization scheme to optimize your menu to minimize this cost for the user if you know what the user is going to do. So you can trace it very mathematically uh, using that. Awesome. Yeah, if that's you're interested interesting. In that. like, and, yeah. yeah, you can you can totally like apply stuff like that. And I mean, you, you can feel it as well. Like if you end up missing the button all the time, you can be like, oh, well, yeah, it's because I've had to move my mouse really fast and then I have to slow down at the end and I miss the button because it's too small and too far away. And yeah, it's interesting how those work with the corner of the screen as well, because the corner of the screen ends up being like infinitely big because you can throw your mouse all the way up to the corner and it, it automatically gets stopped. Okay. Um, 
so yeah, these were just kind of three rules of thumb. Um, but there's there's other different lenses you can use to kind of analyze your 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 design, um, like about this things about typography and iconography, um, and many other things to consider when you're when you're designing your UI is how is it going to localize? Like if I have a whole bunch of icons, do those icons mean the same thing in other other cultures? Um, and do I have enough space on my buttons? It's like simple, but it 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 really makes a difference. Um, yeah. So that's the end of the second section. Are there any rules on when you make some features hotkeys and when you have to click them with a mouse? Um, if you're talking about PC games, then I mean, ideally you make it so everything has a keyboard shortcut. But I mean, it's not always practical. Uh, I'd say it would be good to have everything be able to be bindable. Like even if you don't give it like an automatic, like when the game, when you know, when the play user installs the game, you might not give it a default binding, but you always want the player to be able to bind something to it. I mean, that's kind of related to accessibility because there might be some players that can't click on things, but they have a, a key, they're better with a keyboard so they can kind of bind, you know, bind everything, you know, control I, control whatever. Um, but in terms of which ones you would make hotkeys, it, it's basically what is most used um, and what is most used by power users as well. It depends on what your, your game is, but for industries of Titan, um, everything's clickable. You should be able to, I think you can do everything with, through the mouse, I think. Uh, but then there's some features that are only, no wait, you can do everything through the mouse, but there are some things that are easier to do with keyboard shortcuts because they're for power users. Um, so instead of you know clicking on something twice, you can do it with one keyboard shortcut. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I think so. Okay. So this is just the looking at the bit. time. We have fifteen minutes left. Oh, okay. I can go through this quick, or I can skip it. To be honest, I'll do the I'll do the interesting bits then. I keep thinking we had more time. Okay, we'll skip this one. Da 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 da. Yeah 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 yeah. Okay, so this is kind of the rough, we've talked about this already a bit about the iteration and stuff, um, but this is kind of my design process. Um, so I research the genre usually, like if you're making a city building game, you play a whole bunch of city building games. Um, so that looks like playing a bunch of city building games because players will come to your game with existing ideas. Um, so you take a bunch of screenshots and notes, um, and you are trying to, yeah, see what it's like to be a new user. I'll skip through some of these. The slides will be online, so you can kind of go into this in a bit more detail. Um, I basically take notes. What's good? Oh, look, the UI is really nice in this game. Um, it's it's the buttons are all consistent size. Um, oh, in this game, there's no feedback. So like that's like an event thing, right? Like when I change, when I give an order, the game state has changed. Uh, but it's nothing is shown, so that's not clear. Uh, do, do, do. There's a whole bunch of online references on these websites, screenshots. So a lot of it's just like taking screenshots of like a hundred million different strategy games and trying to work out what's consistent. So like, oh, the button's generally at the top. Uh, yeah, anyway, this is, you can look through this in your own time. So by player flow, I'm kind of where will they go in the game? Like in Overwatch, that's like, okay, they start at the main menu, they choose the, the mode, they move to character selection. So this is kind of like the first stage of design that I do. Um, then I do per element mocks. So this is what we talked about before. So you kind of want to do as many paper sketches as you can because they get more expensive later. So a styled mock might be something you do in Photoshop uh, and then doing the actual code and cutting out the assets so they can be used in the game would take a day. So you want to do as much iteration as you can at the start. Uh, OK, I'm going to answer these questions at the end because I'm going to skip these. Yeah. So these yeah, are like we, really we rough. questions at the end. So students, collect your, your questions. You can post it, and we will talk about it in five minutes. So in Industries of Titan, it was literally like, this is how the main menu will be. It's like really kind of redundant, but it gets you thinking about do you want to have like on the city builder? These are the things I want to have on the menu. I want a mini map. I want some notifications. I want a button. Where am I going to put them? And so I had like a really rough mock, something like this. 
Um, do you do it digitally or do you do it on paper? Usually I do it on paper because it's quicker, but I know a lot of people that do it in, you can use anything. You can use MS Paint. You can use, uh, you know, some people even use uh, like a, a PowerPoint or something. You can use anything. It's just some, whatever's quick, right? Um, and then this is like a styled mock where it's like, okay, we've got a little bit more information about what buttons there are. They're, they're kind of, it's gross, but I've kind of shown roughly where things will go. Um, yeah. So then the in-app gray box is like, in level design, you have the idea of a gray box where you, you kind of design the, the level flow, but with no textures or anything. You're just putting down blocks. So you kind of feel like, oh, how does it feel to run around this way? How long does it take um, for players to get from here to here? Where can the enemies shoot me from? Uh, what attracts the eye? This is before doing any art. So this is kind of what this looks like in game. It's basically what we had before, you know, mocked up in Photoshop, but like with a bunch of default widgets and a bunch of default assets and just kind of, we can start clicking on things. We can, these are, it should be usable, um, but looks ugly. Um, and then you might realize like, oh, actually the mini map is too small. It needs to be bigger. And I like it on the left or um, these buttons are way too small to click. These should be like double the size. Um, so you don't have to like redo all the art. You just kind of stretch the buttons to be bigger. Um, yeah, let's get this. And then this is the kind of final bit where you just keep iterating. Um, you do the art, like it's pretty big, but it's not really my area of expertise. Um, but it's where the the kind of mock-up goes from this to something like this with a bit more art thrown around. Uh, it's still kind of ugly. We don't have a lot of like fancy icons yet. Um, and then we do a bit more on it. So this is Industry of Titan. You have some more icons and things, and then you kind of iterate a bit further uh, and you know polish things up a bit. It's very much like an iterative process is what I'm trying to show here. Um, okay, we can skip through some of these. Yada, 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 yada. This is like, oh, you could do really wacky interactions. Like, ah. <laughs> so yeah, let's skip these. Uh, yeah, and if you have any major changes in your game design, you have to go back. So like suddenly, oh, you need uh, three extra buttons uh, in the, the top left-hand corner. Maybe you want to like, or like a brand new way of interacting with uh, the shop. Oh, the, in the shop, you used to be able to only buy stuff, but now you can trade. Like, oh, okay, you got to redesign what that might look like. Um, okay, sorry about skipping the end, but hopefully you can go back and look at the slides online. Um, yeah. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> no, the end, but like, yeah, but well, there was a lost it to the end. quite click, uh, quick in the end. But um, yeah, we have a bit of time to take questions now. Um, you want to talk about also a bit about Brace Yourself games. And if you have more questions about the things we skipped over, then yeah, yeah we're both around for a bit. So feel free to shoot your questions. Um, yeah, Brace Yourself Games, we're in, we're in town. Um, we're based in Vancouver. Originally, we're famous for, we made Crypto the Necrodancer when there was only three people in the company. Um, I joined after that. And when we started making Industries of Titan and Phantom Brigade, which are kind of like a city building game and a kind of mech strategy game. Uh, Necrodancer is like a rhythm game um, where you kind of hop around to the beat. It's like a roguelike mixed with a rhythm game. And then kind of based on that, we made Cadence of Hyrule, which is like a Zelda crossover game um, where it's Zelda hopping around to the beat um, and we released it on Switch. So yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I think you had a few questions there already. Uh, yeah, okay. Not sure which one is first best to answer. Scroll up. Uh, is there a... So there were a few questions by Kevin, for instance, about whether yeah. it's worth to try out something new. Like you said, you should look at all the previous games. So maybe it's good to come with a fresh mind. Um, I, th I think in it's, yeah, there is a risk by playing a bunch of games that you would get set in the mindset of like, oh, this is the way it's done, so I'm just going to do that, and you get lazy. I think ideally you would be able to, you know free your mind and break free of that like because the, the problem is all of the players are going to be coming to your game with those expectations i mean not all of them but anybody that's played that genre they're probably interested in your game because they like that kind of game so if you come up with something that's like completely revolutionary 
a lot of the players are not going to be used to it. So you need to know where their head is going to be at when they come to your game um, to be like, okay, this is what you're used to. Maybe I support that, but here's my revolutionary idea. And I kind of like ease you into it and like balance between, you know, completely revolutionary and something that players are comfortable with. Um, and I think if, if you play a bunch of existing games, you can hopefully play them with a critical eye and understand like, okay, I get why everyone does this. I can maybe improve on it slightly or, I get everyone, why everyone does this. I'm not going to change it because you don't need to change everything for every game. Because if you did, players would be just lost and confused. You know, the button is a button. You don't have to reinvent the wheel for like everything. And uh, there's a quite opposite question by Jaron. Um, what about license issues? Can you simply copy something you see in a game? I, I mean, can you copy the concept or is there some digital <laughs> uh, you know, patent or? As far as I know, if you I mean don't don't copy people's art, like I think you could get sued for that by just like ripping textures uh, and and fonts and stuff. Those are live licensing issues. But in terms of like copying a particular way of interacting with the UI, I mean I think there are some patents out there, but I haven't had to deal with them. Um, for simple stuff like you know clicking on a button and sliding a a thing, like it's as far as I know those aren't patented, um, but they could be in theory. I mean, there's like that famous one that's like a, a mini game during a loading screen is like patented by um, uh, Namco, I think. I don't know whether that's, that's, that's expired now, but yeah, so you can't do that as far as I know. Seriously? Um, yeah, as far as I know, like they patented that. Like, so. Be careful. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> um, there's one from Spencer. How do UI designers feel about third party UI overlays? You showed the World of Warcraft thing, I think, which perhaps not every i think that wasn't a ui designed by blizzard but some custom one you as a as a designer working in this area how do you oh. feel about others changing it or adding things to it right so like mods and things so it's just kind of like yeah. change or fix things with the ui um i mean if someone did that to industries of titan i'd probably be really happy because i'd be i'd learn a lot i'd be like okay if, the, if someone's taken the time to make this there's clearly something they felt was missing um, maybe I can learn from that. Uh, it, yeah, like I think with players that the feelings they have, they're never wrong. Like you might, the, the suggestions they make might be, you know, might be able to like interpret those in different ways. But like if if they feel that something is takes too long to 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 interact with, like um, I remember uh, there's a, a mod for Skyrim a long time ago where it just made the inventory like more. Uh, more slots on screen for PC players because the, the game was designed and built for consoles first and foremost. So these mods kind of fixed it for PC players. So they're not wrong. And I think you shouldn't take like offense. Uh, he's also um, asking afterwards why are hotkeys usually customizable but UI is not? I mean, that's implementation time, to be honest. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's one thing to like have a little config file that like remaps keys, but to make the UI customizable. I mean, you're talking about like every window needs to be draggable, resizable. What do you allow to be moved? Uh, do you do you let things be resized? Like it's there are some games that support that, but it, it's a lot of work, and you have to do it from kind of like day one, um, and really invest in that. And then I you have to what, kind of realize what we that, saw like, for World of Warcraft, they have a scripting language, so that's probably one layer of giving the the modder all the tools. You have to yeah. do hardcore programming to really make it work but then you can yeah but i think i i would wonder in that case they might have actually made that scripting thing for in-house designers because you know mm -hmm. if you have to do a quest where you need a particular custom widget you don't want that to be like a massive overhead for the the programmers have to have to do you want like a and it's such a big company you can just you can have like a programmer dedicated to making those tools that will serve both in-house designers and players and so yeah, in some situations like that, like you, you can be lucky that that oh well, you had to make these tools anyway for for the in-house team, and they know that World of Warcraft is going to be something that is going to be have to be maintained for like you know decades to come. So it's a, it's a worthwhile investment. Industries of Titan does not have a customizable UI. There's some like bits you can kind of hide and and stuff, but it's like you can't drag and drop uh, windows around. And that was something we thought about at the start, but with one UI programmer, um, I didn't want to have to support that. <laughs> yeah, that's a, an honest answer. <laughs> Any other questions on? Yeah, maybe tell us a bit about your. Uh, uh, how does a normal working day look for you? 
how many hours uh, do you sit in front of your i mean a normal one not in COVID times <laughs> how does your um, office look like uh, these kind of things yeah i mean it, most of the time i'm i mean there's there's you know adding new features and there's like fixing bugs is basically how stuff gets i'm fixing bugs is just like programming and or like um but like adding new features or changing the ui is like okay i'll talk to the the artist uh, about uh, what the new feature is what do we need to support we'll come up with some mocks uh on paper or he'll send me some mocks uh and we'll talk about like okay what about in this case we need to show this uh state change or this state to the player uh and we'll kind of like work through it like that on paper and then he might send me a mock-up in photoshop um with some more styling and some more art and then i'll implement like a first pass uh and then yeah, I mean that's kind of like what work days look like. It just it depends on what I what my tasks are. Um, yeah. And from the programming side, are there any I don't know programming patterns or any uh, what kind of tools do you use? Libraries or is it all an in-house um, system so use, you you've built yourself? Or so we use uh, Unreal Engine, and I've built a bunch of things on top of that. Uh, a bunch of custom widgets. Um, a lot of it's uh kind of event driven so there's there's delegates that you you have that you kind of register for you say okay uh this event is fired when the the ship is blown up and you register to like hey please notify me when a ship is blown up and then the ui will say okay when the ship is blown up uh we want to spawn this window uh that says like you, you have lost your ship or um when the player is uh you know, every or in some other situations, you might say, "Oh, every frame, check whether the storage is full," um, and show things like. So, I mean, I guess that's a paradigm. Is like the delegates kind of like subscriber, like event-based um, mm -hmm. program. And then you can script all these things, or that C plus plus code that you would be it, coding. It's all C plus uh, plus. Unreal has built-in stuff for called Blueprints, which is like a visual scripting language. Um, I don't use it as much, but a lot of people use it for kind of scripting events and, and mm -hmm. yeah, stuff like that. There's one more question. How active are researchers on new IO systems? How does that oh. affect the UI development? IO systems, like uh, I've seen well, like eye tracking and, and kind of completely different ways of interacting with stuff like VR. I guess it depends on what you mean by IO systems. Uh, I mean, there's, yeah, I've seen like different kind of IO systems, like, yeah, like eye tracking and, and there's like uh, leap motion Oh, alternatives mm -hmm. to mouse and keyboards. Yeah, input stuff. Uh, brain interfaces <laughs> coming soon. I mean, yeah, you can. There's definitely like uh, you can get some. Some games will support certain peripherals like that. Um, usually, if the peripheral manufacturer like you know pays you to like add support for that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that would go uh, that way. That... Yeah, like I mean, it, it's a case of like you would add support for it if you think the market is big enough. I mean, it, it, the problem with games, or well, the problem, or well, the, the the reality of games is that it's a business usually, um, and you would add support for a certain peripheral or a certain input output thing if there's a big enough market for it. Mm -hmm. um, so like that's why VR took off to a certain extent is when it it reaches a certain number of of users, you know that like okay, if I it costs this much to make the game, there's this many users there, then I might make a profit. But you know, if only you know four hundred people have a really cool custom input thing, then it's hard to you know make a game and turn a profit on that. Um, in terms of research, like I'm sure some of the big companies are probably doing stuff like that. I mean, that's how uh, all of these advanced VR things have come out of uh, Valve is because they've got so much money that they can <laughs> actually just spend money and 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 you know human power on research. Um, Awesome. Yeah, I think we should end the official um, section of this. So it's six twenty already. Um, so everybody who has to go, who wants to have dinner now, feel free to leave. Thanks for your attention. I will stop the recording, and yeah.